Thank you. I suppose it's always me buying the pints. Shh, all right, we're presenting. Hello and welcome to the final episode of the season of Gone Feral. Yes, you've guessed it, we still have two more wildlife films to share with you. Our first film is about how we got on with a challenge set to us by an old friend. Hello Ed and Harry. Last year for Gone Feral, you two forced me to say massive fat pigeon. And now that's basically all anyone ever says to me. So this year I've set you to a challenge. You've got one day to complete it. Good luck, you massive fat idiots. So Harry and I packed our bags and made our way to the start point for our challenge. Iceland, in London. Good morning. So Hugo has prepared us a list of species that can be found here in London. And our challenge is to try and find and photograph all of them in one day. And Harry and I will be competing to see who can get the best photo of each species. So we commuted to our first location. Richmond Park. So Hugo has put red and fallow deer on the list. This should be nice and easy. Well, that was easy. Fallow deer are the smaller of the two deer species found in Richmond Park and have the most variation of coat colours of any British deer. Finding them isn't a challenge, but getting an interesting photograph is. To find out who wins the challenge, our photos would face a public vote at the end of the day. Mist just makes everything look so good. Look at this. I don't know, those are quite good actually. Harry's misty deer photos were nice, but I wanted to add a more human element to mine. I'm going to try and get a photo of Harry getting photos of deer. I'm going to call it amateur hour. I think it'll look quite good. Are you photographing me or the deer? No, I photograph the deer. Fallow photos in the bag, we moved on to our next species. Fallow deer, done. Well done. Nice. What's next? Red deer. Once cameraman Sam had finished filming what he considered wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Right, well, we've managed to find the red deer. They're not that scared of us because this is Richmond Park, so <laughs> unlike properly wild deer, these are more like livestock and just roam around. These nonchalant red deer are the biggest species in the UK and have an entertaining symbiotic relationship with jackdaws, where the birds eat bugs and ticks hiding in the deer's fur, which can make for some quite interesting photos. Jackdaw on a back door. <laughs> Although I still preferred my new technique. With both deer species ticked off, we quickly stumbled across another item on Hugo's list. I think this is a rabbit warren. There are lots of uh, dropping. Of course it's a rabbit warren. Look at it. Let's get some distance between us and the warren, and then if we wait it out for half an hour, maybe? Yeah, yeah this works. Cameraman Sam Johnson, move out of the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Rabbits, done. Before leaving the park, we had a quick stab at photographing one more species on the list, a green woodpecker. Bugger. With questionable results. Anyway, the photos still count, so we headed further into the city. Which confused cameraman Sam. Oh, fox. And country boy Harry. We headed to one of the more inner city parks to look for ring necked parakeets, but on the way we encountered some other little critters on Hugo's list. Squirrels. Grey squirrels came to the UK in the 1800s and have frankly decimated the red squirrel population but you can't blame the individuals for just trying to survive. Well, squirrels are on Hugo's list, so I guess we should try and get a photo while they're here. <laughs> Which lens are you going for? I'm going for the 50 mil, so this mil. is, yeah, quite wide. As they are so approachable, we went with wide-angle lenses to get some fun perspectives of the squirrels. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I haven't got one yet. <laughs> you better start trying harder, mate. I need a squirrel. Come on. Come on, little fella. This way. No. <laughs> Although they were great fun, we had to bid farewell to the squirrels as we still had seven more species to photograph. Squirrels, tick. tick. Nice. <sighs> what next? Parakeets. parakeets. That's okay. what we came for. Let's go find the parakeets. <laughs> Yes, London is home to thousands of ring-necked parakeets, and Kensington Gardens is a great place to see them. <laughs> we found the green parakeets. Look at them all in the tree. <laughs> aren't they great? Like the grey squirrels, these birds aren't native, and their origin story isn't at all clear. The story we like best is that guitarist Jimi Hendrix released a breeding pair in Mayfair for the sheer hell of it and the entire British population now stems from those two feathery Adam and Eves. I'm going to swap to my medium zoom, my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. This one. Hand feeding the parakeets is not encouraged. It can make them aggressive and dodgy food waste can contaminate the local waterways. It is a grey area though, and a stray apple or two that finds its way onto a fence is unlikely to be detrimental to the local ecosystem. Ring neck parakeets, done. Nice. Another one. Okay, well, that was pretty good. So, yeah, what's next on there? <laughs> we can do a fancy duck. En route to finding a fancy duck, we managed to tick off two more species. First, the great crested grebe, a bird that was nearly hunted to extinction in the Victorian era for its decorative head plumage, but has since made a recovery thanks to conservation efforts. And second, the cormorant, On the post. a water-going bird that by some evolutionary misfortune isn't actually waterproof. That's why you often see them stretching their wings out to dry. So, two more species in the bag, but still no ducks of the fancy variety. Hopefully we might have one more chance though. We haven't managed to find a fancy duck yet, but we do need to visit another lake anyway, because Hugo has tasked us with trying to find a pelican. Off to a good start, I reckon. But we'll rejoin our urban adventure later. Yes, first we have a completely different film about when Harry well and truly buggered off all the way up to the most northern point of the UK. Oh, for goodness sake. It's meant to be on the Harry setting. Yeah, there we go. 100 miles north of the UK mainland stands a special archipelago. Shetland is made up of 15 islands, but since these animations take a long time to make, here are the three biggest ones. Mainland in the south, nestled in the middle, Yell, and at the top, Unst. And I went to this group of islands to photograph birds. Today's mission was simply to get to Lerwick by a 13-hour ferry crossing. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the most exciting day. <laughs> Today's task was to drive up the mainland, get another ferry to Yell, and then one last ferry up to Unst. En route, though, I took my first photo of the trip. This is a snipe, a bird with beautifully complex plumage and the illusion of having one leg. It's unusual to see them perching out in the open. They usually tuck themselves away on the ground. And then to end the day, I set my tent up in a sheep field and ate my dinner, beans. Today, I decided to explore the island and to channel my inner birder. In a secluded bay, I noticed the long tail feathers and sleek squat posture of an Arctic skewer. I usually don't enjoy lying in wet sand, but in this case, I didn't mind. It allowed me an intimate perspective with this avian pirate. Then, to be honest, I just spent the rest of the day walking around looking at the views without taking any more photos. 
Today got off to an unexpected start. I was walking along a beach on Unst when my phone pinged. I feared the worst. Thankfully, it wasn't Ed asking to come and join me. What it was, was an alert for Orca. So I got a shift on and drove to the south coast of Unst, where I got very lucky. A pod of Orca, known as the 27s, were moving through Yell Sound, right in front of me. Although this record shot won't win any awards, the encounter will stick with me forever. So to celebrate my first ever wild orca sighting, I ended the day with a big bowl of beans. These four days have been amazing. I hiked up to Hermaness every day to focus on the Atlantic puffins. These charming little ladies and gentlemen nest on the land during the summer and head out to sea for the rest of the year. They're very approachable and inquisitive, making them excellent subjects. I was photographing a single puffin sat on a big grassy ledge when another bird hopped into frame, prompting this sweet interaction. In this image, I tried to use the light more artistically, where cloud layers caused a beam of sunlight to burst through onto the ocean. I shot this image using a wide-angle lens to include more landscape. With this final puffin image, I went for a close-up whilst it sheltered from powerful gusts. I like the eye contact and body positioning, with the head and wing feathers blowing in the wind. Despite feeling isolated at times on the cliffs, I felt an overwhelming sense of calm. Actually, that was probably because Ed wasn't there. <laughs> Today, I turned my attention from puffins to puffin eaters, great skewers. These birds are actually quite beautiful and surprisingly sociable, despite their unfriendly reputation. I photographed this one amongst the cotton grass in the afternoon sun. It's vital to avoid disturbing these birds, so I kept a good distance and tried to stay as still as possible. This one is a bit more dynamic, as one territorial skewer knocks another from its perch to claim the lookout spot. Now, I did call these birds puffin eaters earlier, so if you're squeamish, I suggest you look away now. These incredible images were taken by wildlife filmmaker and photographer Martina Andres on Shetland during the same time I was there. They offer a fascinating insight into the harsh reality of life in a seabird colony. A bit brutal, but awesome photos. Shetland was blowing me away, literally. For my final three days on the islands, I decided to focus on the immense colonies of gannets. Here on Shetland, there are about 25,000 breeding pairs of gannets. The birds outnumber the human population by a factor of two. I wanted to get photos of multiple gannets at once, so I positioned myself up on the cliff looking down. I like this first image because the gannets form a lovely spiral, drawing you in to the centre of the photo. And with this image, I wanted to show the savageness of the gannets' environment. I took over 1,000 images to try and make sure I captured the crashing waves at the exact right moment. Yeah, this day wasn't very exciting. I, I just got on the ferry and headed home. Shetland is a really special place though. I spent two weeks there and don't feel like I even scratched the surface, so I'll definitely be back. And maybe next time I'll let Ed come too. Right, you must be pretty chuffed with those photos then. Absolutely, yeah, no, I was, I was really pleased with how some of those came out. Even the orca one? Mate, come on, look, there's a record shot, it doesn't count. I think it's one of your better photos, actually. <laughs> Five down. Five down. Anyway, we need to get back to our London challenge. There's only one population of pelicans in the UK, 
and it's in St James's Park. So that's where we headed. Right, what's this big building then? No idea. Good idea. Oh no. <laughs> Ed, how did you do that? Oh. <laughs> and that's the lake where the pelicans are. So what, what do we need? Pelicans, pelicans, fancy, fancy duck, duck, and then anything else. And then we'll do pigeons afterwards while it's still light. Three more bird species to get, and hopefully we can get two of them here. Let's go. So we bravely ventured into the wilderness. This wasn't going to be easy. Oh, <laughs> well that was easy. <laughs> that was very easy. We found the pelicans. Pellingtons. Well, I suppose we are bloody good at wildlife spotting. Anyway, with no time to spare, we prepared to pap the pellies. This isn't a good angle. Look at him go. Whoa. Oh, like oh big fella. Oh, the first pelicans here were a present to King Charles II in 1664 from a Russian ambassador. They can weigh up to 15 kilograms and can fly, so there's nothing prohibiting them from leaving the park. Although they are fed fish here daily, so they don't have much impetus to leave. They kind of look like a robo swan that we built last year. <laughs> so you'll see this is classic Edwin. I've got a really unique composition oh, and he's plonked up. himself down Shut right up. next to me. It's brilliant. Well, in fairness, it worked. Whoa, look at them go. Look at the splash. Whoa. As we wrapped up with our Pelly Pals, we spotted something exquisite. Harry, look at that one over there, that duck. Oh my God, it's a ruddy duck, isn't it? Is that a ruddy duck? I don't know. Why don't you use my book? <laughs> yes, get your book out. <laughs> Wildfowl, 21. I think it's a ruddy duck. I think you're a ruddy duck. <laughs> there isn't a section called Fancy Ducks, sadly. I don't know if it's going to be in here, because it might not be native. What the hell is this? Oh, I know what it might be. I've successfully identified it. It wasn't a ruddy duck. It was a ruddy shell duck. Does that, that count as a fancy duck? That is absolutely a fancy duck. Well, we need to get some photos of it. So that is a ruddy shell duck. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know that. I've just been doing this for years. Ruddy shell ducks are not native, and this one has most likely escaped from someone's private collection. In some Buddhist countries, the shell duck is specially protected, as its colour is said to resemble that of the robes that monks wear. And that is the best fact that we could find online. Oh, look. Ah. Hey. Hey. <laughs> That's very rude. Very rude. Fancy duck smashed it. Hey, hey. Oh, okay. Yes. So Hugo set us one more species that we need to get before it gets dark. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> Which is, we need to get a photo with 20 feral pigeons, or gone feral pigeons in it. So we're going to head to Trafalgar Square. So we're going to go right down Pal Pal Mall. Pal Mall. It's closed. No, it's not. We can sneak through. It's fine. Oh. I'm sure we can get through here, though. You stupid donkey. Do you want me to, to navigate? No, it's fine. Country boy? No, it's fine. I've got directions. Why oh, don't you give on. me the phone? So hang on. If that was the what right way. Let's just pull what, over. What do you mean that no, was the right way? No, this is my phone. Dead end. Your navigational skills are shit. We are en route to Trafalgar Square. Hugo had specifically requested the photo of the pigeons be right in London's iconic centre. But when we got there, we encountered a slight issue. It says you can't trade with the pigeons anymore. The clearly political anti-pigeon okay. movement had somewhat scuppered our plan. Wherever we looked, no great pigeon flocks remained. So we came up with a backup plan. Harry, there's no big hordes of pigeons. Let's do who can get the best oh. photo of just a pigeon then, okay? Just one. one yeah, pigeon. okay, one pigeon. Hello. I'm going to use a wide angle lens again to try and give some context to this place because we want to be able to see some of Trafalgar Square as well as the pigeon. Otherwise, we might as well just photograph them anywhere. What are you going to do? Well, I mean, it, the same. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to work, but Harry's nerves weren't helping. This isn't quite what I had in mind, but I think it could still work because there's a lovely background. Just got to get the pigeon now. Go on, then, <laughs> there are people there. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. 
So he resorted to sabotage. So, oh, hang on, there's some over there, actually. No, what a twat. And thieving my photos. Uh, I'll take it from here. I'll take it from here. <laughs> Leave my pigeon alone. <laughs> you get off my pigeon. But I did get my chance eventually. Yes! <laughs> Lovely museum thing behind it. No one cares about that. But the pigeon looks good. So, with pigeons done, we only had two species left, which were most active after dark. So we have two more species on Hugo's list to find, and those are mice and foxes. Where are we going to head win, Edwin? Uh, we're going to start by looking for a mouse. Our plan was to find a mouse in one of the underground tube stations. Mice are infamous for scurrying about the platforms, but after hours of searching dozens of stations, we just couldn't find any. After speaking to a couple of tube drivers, we were informed, anecdotally, that the lack of commuters due to the recent lockdown meant the mice had struggled to find scraps of food and were now scarcer than ever. This was our first failure on Gone Feral. We'd been defeated by the smallest of obstacles. We weren't done yet though. We still wanted to get all the other species on the list. So in our final half hour before midnight, we went after a red fox. So, we've got about 20 minutes left until midnight, but I think it's fair to say we've done a fair share of walking today. <laughs> 18 miles. And then, with just a few minutes left, we actually spotted one. Fox, fox! Yes, well done. Okay, road. brilliant. Good spot. Well, it's gone midnight, so that's oh, game over. We're finished. But we did manage to get Red Fox. Have a look at this. Oh, man, these, this is the worst photo of an urban fox <laughs> I've, I've ever taken. I don't know about yours, but look at that. They are absolutely atrocious. And that is it. That's all I got. But we got Red Fox. <laughs> we did it. Yes. <laughs> Come on. Well done, man. Well done. All right, <sighs> should we go to bed? <laughs> yeah, not together, let's go. <laughs> Technically, we both lost because we failed to photograph a mouse. But we still had the public vote, and it confirmed what we already knew, that I am, by far, the better photographer. Right, I live in London, and I see mice literally all the time, especially on the underground. I can't believe we didn't see any. Oh man, I know. Sorry, Hugo, we failed your challenge. Well, that's it for this season. Yes, so thank you to everyone who's watched the series, and especially to those of you who've enjoyed it. We really love making these films, and every bit of support and appreciation really helps us keep pushing for better photos, bigger adventures, and even better wildlife encounters. So thanks again to everybody who has watched this series, and to all the people who have helped us make it. Cheers. We'll be back soon.